All right. So I think Alan's given us a lot to think about tonight in regard to dating and marriage. Um, and as a, a teacher at a university with so many young people, uh, and as a husband and now having children, uh, this idea of dating and of marriage is something that I think is very critical uh, that I don't think we can think enough about, uh, especially in the areas of, of purity and holiness. Uh, and so that's one thing that we are talking about with my son, uh, Ryder, being six, uh, that he needs to be a gentleman. Uh, he can get some wild sometimes, and so trying to uh, curtail him and try to help him to be a gentleman to, to everyone, especially to his older sister, uh, to treat women right, I think is something that is uh, very important uh, as parents that we need to do. Uh, and so this idea of dating and trying to raise children uh, such that they uh, have respect for what God has made is very important. Uh, my job this evening uh, is to follow up on uh, this discussion of dating and marriage, to then talk about marriage and divorce. Um, and so it's interesting that Ethan led the song, uh, He Has Made Me Glad, uh, and then we're going to talk about divorce. Um, kind of odd uh, putting those two things together. Um, but uh, if you have your Bibles, if you want to go ahead and turn over to Matthew chapter 19, uh, Matthew chapter 19, that's where we're going to spend most of our time tonight. Uh, then we'll use other verses to help supplement that. Uh, but Matthew 19, uh, in this passage here, we're picking up uh, really closer at the end of Jesus' ministry uh, on earth. Uh, he's moving away uh, from the area of Galilee, going toward Jerusalem, uh, mainly for crucifixion. Uh, but as often is the case, as we see him then getting closer uh, to that area, crowds get bigger and bigger uh, as Jesus' popularity has spread over the years that he's been uh, preaching and uh, performing miracles. And so he goes and he's performing miracles, it says there, that he's healing people of disease. Uh, but then we see the Pharisees uh, kind of come up to trip him up with some troubling questions, especially questions really of that day. And we might pause before we dig in here and consider why. Like, why are the Pharisees always trying to trap Jesus and trip him up? And pose questions that maybe would get flustered, he would get flustered with, or, or he might say something wrong. Um, and I think it's because of a passage that we see in John chapter 11. And I'll have it up here, you don't have to turn to it. Um, but in this context, he's bringing people to faith. People are believing in him because of his teaching, because of, because of his miracles. Uh, and here in this verse, it says, So from that day on, they made plans to put him to death. And so, essentially, the people are out to get Jesus, who hate Jesus, and they're going to do everything they can to get public opinion against him, uh, whether they have to say lies about him or gin them up to, to say, crucify him, crucify him. Um, and so here, I think the, the, the Pharisees are coming to Jesus, really trying to stick him with this question, um, really to, to help destroy people's uh, faith in him and confidence in him, uh, to see him as some type of heretic or something. And so the passage that they then bring up is then recorded for us here in Matthew chapter 19. And so in verses 1 through 3, it says, Now when Jesus had finished these sayings, he went away from Galilee and entered the region of Judea, beyond the Jordan, and large crowds followed him, and he healed them there. And Pharisees came up to him and tested him by asking, Is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? Now, honestly, that seems like a question society asks today, right? That they might even ask us if we're friends with them and they're having marity, maybe marital problems, and they say, hey, is it okay if I just divorce my spouse? And maybe if we ask people in, in society today, if we stop somebody, maybe if we're given the survey door to door and we added that question, do you think you can divorce anyone for any reason? How many people might just say yes? But what do you suppose Jesus says in response here? And I think as Christians, as people who, who really try to live our lives and, and, and teach others around us what the Bible says, this is a very critical question. And so in the following verses, it says, He answered, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? And said, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. And so Jesus returns to the text that we looked at last night, to creation. Actually, many things relating to marriage and our roles as men and women can be directly linked 
to the first chapters of the Bible. And, and as an aside, um, when people start doing damage to the creation account, inserting their human wisdom, we should truly give pause and consider the valuable text that they are trying to distort to defend their selfish views and interpretations. We need to be very, very careful. But here I think Jesus wants these Pharisees that are challenging him and the large crowd following him, and those probably, when they hear this question, kind of leaning forward like, whoa, whoa, what's, what's Jesus going to say? He wants them to think about what God said in the beginning. Because if there was a way things started, then maybe that's how things should perpetuate. It's interesting, if you look at where Jesus is right now, geographically at this point in time, he's back in the area where John the Baptist was, where he was teaching and baptizing people there. And it was also John who was beheaded for standing up against Herod in his improper marriage and divorce situation. And so it's interesting that this is the same trap they're laying out now for Jesus. And so Jesus points to the bond of marriage that is an institution created by God, not by man, and that this joining together is done by God. And if God is actively creating a union between a man and a woman, a marriage, then man has no right to separate it. He is not falling into the cultural trap that they're laying out for him and the religious fighting and the bickering that's going on. He really rises above it. And it's interesting that the language here that he uses, what therefore God has joined together, the joined there literally means being yoked together. And that phrase might cause our minds to remember 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? This warning of marrying someone outside the faith, someone who does not believe, ties to the bond created by God. Him yoking literally two people together in marriage. It's a powerful connection with the ideas of dating, I think, being critical. That you're being then tied together to that person forever. And the spiritual ramifications for you and them and your families now and your families to come matters. But going back to the response of Jesus, this was one of the options of the trap of the Pharisees, what he said. And so now they counter Jesus with the following words. They say to him, Why then did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and to send her away? It's kind of like, aha! We got you, Jesus! You fell right into our trap! Moses said that you could divorce! You can kind of see him like, we got him. Moses was the man who stood there on the mountain in the presence of God, who received the written law from God. The words were from him via God's command. And the passage that they're referencing is Deuteronomy chapter 24. Deuteronomy 24, 1 through 4. If you have a, a, a Bible there in front of you, if you turn there, at the, the heading at the top, it says, Laws Concerning Divorce. That man has put in there. And it says, When a man takes a wife and marries her, if then she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some indecency in her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house, and she departs out of his house, and if she goes and becomes another man's wife, and the latter man hates her and writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house, or if the latter man dies, who took her to be his wife, then her former husband, who sent her away, may not take her again to be his wife after she has been defiled. For that is an abomination before the Lord. And you shall not bring sin upon the land that the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance. You can almost feel for the Pharisees, this is like their trump card, right? They had this hidden in their back pocket. If the law of Moses allowed it, then what Jesus is saying isn't right. He's trapped. Now, I want you to think about that for a minute. 
trying to justify our actions because we want a certain outcome. Do we ever try to use the Bible to justify our sin? Do we ever try to defend evil by distorting good? Yes, we do. The church does it and the world does it. Why? Because we're human. Our humanity pulls us towards sin, and we do not want others to condemn us. And so we justify ourselves in whatever ways we can find. But look at the words of Jesus then in verse 8 in response. He said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. The young people today might, might call that a mic drop. That Jesus turns the accusations against him as if he's the one in the wrong. And he says that the root of the wall is actually the hardness of their heart. Their unwillingness to forgive is what brought about the allowance. And he says, and I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. Jesus then takes the passage here from Deuteronomy and essentially causes it to crystallize for them. The entire discussion then hinges on the violation of what God joined together. It turns the attention to those in the marriage and focuses on the idea of adultery. Jesus says that adultery violates the marriage. And because of that, then, divorce is allowed by the innocent party. If one of the two in the marriage divorces the other for a cause other than adultery and marries another, then they become the guilty party in the marriage. The reason Jesus takes this argument from the side of men, and some people want to to take this passage and use it only for men, The reason that he takes it from this side is because that's what the passage in Deuteronomy is looking at. And so he uses that same perspective. That it equally applies to men as it does women. And so in this small statement, Jesus says, No, you can't divorce your spouse without cause. And the only reason you can divorce your spouse is because of adultery. Now, this is not a popular stance in the world today because people make rash decisions and those in marriage often hurt each other. And it would be so much easier to just divorce, to give up, to move on. It is easier to tear up a piece of paper on which man recorded the marriage than to fight, strengthened by the power of God to resolve the trouble and love God And love each other as God commands. Because that's what God wants. As his creation, especially in the bond of marriage, he wants us to fight for love. What's interesting with the language found throughout the prophets, if you read them and if you know them, is that God constantly uses the example of adultery when describing his people who have turned away to worship idols and who have turned to live blatant sin. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Hosea, Micah, and the list could go on. All of these use this language. We might wonder why. Why does God use the language of adultery to talk about his people? Because the sin of adultery is personal. It violates the intimate relationships of those who are to love each other. Till death do us part, as we say. Consider the words of God to his people in Malachi chapter 2, beginning in verse 12. Here he's, he's talking to a people about their lives. He says, here's another thing you do. You cover the Lord's altar with tears, weeping and groaning because he pays no attention to your offerings and doesn't accept them with pleasure. You cry out, why doesn't the Lord accept my worship? I tell you why. Because the Lord witnessed the vows you and your wife made when you were young, but you have been unfaithful to her, though she remained your faithful partner, the wife of your marriage vows. 
Didn't the Lord make you one with your wife? In body and spirit you are his. And what does he want? Godly children from your union. So guard your heart. Remain loyal to the wife of your youth. For I hate divorce, says the Lord, the God of Israel. To divorce your wife is to overwhelm her with cruelty, says the Lord of heaven's armies. So guard your heart. Do not be unfaithful to your wife. I think here you can hear God's pain in this message. You can hear the pain as he looks down on his people from heaven. And it angers him. As it says there in verse 16, For I hate divorce. But though there is anger, I think there's also pain. That it breaks his heart to see the cruelty of those that say they love each other and those that say they love him. So how do we handle this message of God, of our Lord, when it comes to real life situations where marriages are struggling? How do we convince people to consider the great magnitude of marriage and their vows before they make them? How do we help people do what is right when there is so much pain and heartache? I do not believe Matthew records Matthew 19 after the content of Matthew 18, such that it's a coincidence. If you were to go back and look over Matthew chapter 18, it's about forgiveness. It's about going to your brother who's caught in sin to help bring them back to God, to help bring them to repentance that there might be forgiveness. It's about being merciful to those who wrong you and trying to resolve issues to save souls. Because that is how marriage and divorce issue, I think, really boils down. It comes down to doing what is right for the sake of our soul. So what would Jesus do? Especially in light of the fact that he was not married. If the wife of Jesus cheated on him, and committed adultery, do you think Jesus would give her a certificate of divorce? We can't really answer that question with specific realities. But I would encourage you to read through the book of Hosea and see how God uses the relationship between Hosea and Gomer to parallel the love for his people. As God's people are turning away from him and it says they're playing the whore, they're bound to idols, They're prostituting their spiritual lives, even their physical lives, to sin. And what does God show? Well, in Hosea chapter 3, it's a short chapter, only five verses, you see Gomer seemingly go into this life of, of prostitution. And you see then God telling Hosea to do something, and parallels then being drawn. And the Lord said to me, go again. Love a woman who is loved by another man and is an adulteress, even as the Lord loves the children of Israel, though they turn to other gods and love cakes of raisins. So I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and a homer and a lethek of barley. And I said to her, You must dwell as mine for many days. You shall not play the whore or belong to another man. So will I also be to you." For the children of Israel shall dwell many days without king or prince, without sacrifice or pillar, without ephod or household gods. Afterward, the children of Israel shall return and seek the Lord their God and David their king, and they shall come in fear to the Lord and to his goodness in the latter days. It's interesting here, there at the beginning, how it talks about the woman, how she's going after these other things how God's people are going after these other things. And I don't know if you noticed the parallel in some of the verses that Alan read, though from uh, Song of Solomon, I believe it's in chapter 2, verse 5, talking about the raisin cakes and how those were associated with love. Here, there in verse 1, it talks about how they're turning after other gods and love cakes of raisins. That you see this seemingly good thing there in Song of Solomon then being turned into an abomination here in Hosea's days. But God says, I'm going to forgive the adulterer. 
He's willing to forgive the prostitute. He's willing to forgive if they'll turn back to him. He uses then Hosea and Gomer's relationship as a a physical representation of his love for his people. And because our sins are ever before us and will condemn us then in the end if we are not willing to repent, the heart of God is never hardened such that he will not accept our genuine repentance. He will forgive. Alan last night offered a general invitation for us to consider our own lives as we consider these topics this week. And I thought it was a good, uh, a good way to approach these topics. Because maybe you're single and you're not in an opportunity to divorce anyone. Uh, or maybe you are married. But in all of this, can this be us? In a world that glorifies divorce that looks forward to the next immoral relationship, that laughs at subsequent divorces and mocks people that are suffering as their spouses cheat on them in the news? Can we be a people that extend forgiveness on par with God and his forgiveness? If our spouse violates our marriage, can we be like God and offer forgiveness and hate divorce so much that we take back the one that has hurt us so much? Can we as God's people love others like this? I know there are some here who are considering marriage. Uh, our, our, our brother Lee here is getting married very soon. But as we consider marriage, and if we're in a dating relationship that Alan highlighted, can we talk to the one that we love so very much, and openly address the future faithfulness to which we are committing? Can we as God's people live in the love of Christ that can set an example of marriage in the 21st century that turns the tide when it comes to the destructive decision of divorce? There are many statistics that suggest that divorce is rampant in our country, but not only with those that do not trust in God, but also in the church. Can we, as the church, help turn that tide? I hope we can. And I hope the topics discussed tonight can help all of us, single, engaged, married, divorced, widowed, understand how much God loves us and how much he wants us to go above and beyond the love demonstrated by the world, to love others as God does. May we all put this love into practice as we consider all relationships that we have with others, that we might show them Christ in all that we do. Tonight we've looked at the idea of of dating, of what the Bible says about finding someone that can essentially be joined to you. We've talked about the idea of being joined together by God, of being yoked together. I wonder if we were to go back and look at Adam and Eve and think about the idea of God yoking them together, do you think that they were equally or unequally yoked? If God made Adam and he saw the weaknesses in him and he said he needs a help meet, he needs someone to complete him, you could say, do you think Eve did that? Or do you think God made an incomplete and unequally yoked mate for Adam? I don't think so. And so if you think about God making someone to fit together with Adam... That's what God wants for us. He wants us to find another person that will be equally yoked to us, that will help us, that will love us, that will encourage us, that we might all be in heaven together, that we might raise children that love us, that we love them, but that also might love God. And tonight, maybe we can think about that not only in the relationships of marriage, maybe when trouble comes and there's divorce, but also in all of our relationships. Is there a way that we can love people more And love them like God does. Ethan's going to come and lead another song. uh, And if there are things that you need to talk about or discuss, I hope that you will reach out to somebody and share your burdens with them. After that song, we're going to have a closing prayer and then we'll be dismissed. Uh, Tomorrow night, we're going to be looking at other concerns and topics that deal with God's love for people, but especially the unborn and the born. And I hope that you'll be here tomorrow night to share in that study. Thank you.